we'll say something now about, uh, well, I'll try to give you some intuition about where that term comes from, that omega cross the vector term. And then we'll go on to some other things, including uh, translating frames and also some linear momentum and angular momentum, which the rest of the course will be building on. All right. So let me start with a sketch. We've got a particle P that's on, what's that location P and it's on some kind of trajectory. And suppose we want to view the motion of that particle on a, this is, this is a rotating body. It's just supposed to be some arbitrary blob thing. So we've got a, let's say for sake of convenience now, we've got a common origin to a, an inertial frame. So this is just a purely rotating body and it's rotating about this point O. So we have an inertial frame and I use uh, N1 and N2 as unit vectors to specify this uh, an inertial frame. And then we have a frame that's attached to the body and we'll call that B1, B2. And let me say, let's write our two frames. So there's an inertial frame. It's got a, the origin O and then a triad of unit vectors specifies it where N3 has to be N1 cross N2 to make it a, a right-handed coordinate system. The third unit vector must be the first two in cross product in the right order, N1 cross N2 equals N3, all right? And then same for our, we'll call it the body fixed frame. Maybe I'll use a different color, B, blue. We're using the same origin um, and we'll call the directions B1, B2, and then there's also an implied B3 direction, where B3 is B1 cross B2. I is the inertial frame, and B is a, it's a frame attached to the body, and that's why the term, the letter B is used, and we'll use this a lot later. That's the frame attached to the body or sometimes called the body fixed frame, but we could also think of it as a, it's a rotating frame because this body is rotating. So let's say it's, it's rotating with some angular velocity. So this I omega B means it's the rotation of the B frame with respect to the I frame. I omega B and uh, I've just sort of sketched just, okay, the body's rotating. The actual vector specifying omega is going to give both the axis and the rate of rotation. So it isn't exactly how I've drawn it here. That's how you might do it in 2D, but so this specifies the, it's, I say instantaneous, instantaneous because omega could be changing with time. So this specifies the instantaneous axis of rotation by its direction and the rate of rotation by its magnitude. So if we were to be looking at, uh, you know, where's the particle P with respect to, oh, here it is, this orange vector. It's the location of particle P with respect to the origin. And if we want to know how that changes uh, rate with respect to the inertial frame, this get the inertial velocity of P. But suppose we're on the, the body, so we can view things from the point of view of the body, then we use the transport equation. The time derivative with respect to the inertial frame of this vector R is the time derivative with respect to the B frame of that same vector plus the contribution due to just rotation. So 
I omega B cross R P O. All right, so this is from last time. And this is most widely known as the transport equation. In the book, it's equation 813. Okay, so there's some mystery in this second term here. You know, where does that come from? How would I, how would I figure that out? So let me give you an idea by, um, well, maybe I'll first show a little video of a rotating body. Here's a rotating body. So this is a body, unfortunately, omega is pointed down, but, um, and you could use the right hand rule to figure out based on which direction omega is going. Omega is pointing down, so use your right hand. Some points in the direction of omega. The rotation will be in the direction that your fingers will curl. So that's what's going on here. And this is a body where we've got axes labeled one, two, and three. So think of those as B1, B2, and B3. And uh, omega is in the B3 direction here. So that's why you get this rotation. Okay. Uh, back to here. I've got a oh, kind of big. I think this is a figure from Schaub and Junkins, one of the um, kind of optional recommended texts if you're in, interested. So this is showing a, a body, again, some kind of amorphous blob thing. We've got our origin down here, oops, and we have a, a body fixed frame. It doesn't quite matter how you label these as long as they obey the right hand rule, B1, B2, B3, okay. And then we've got this omega vector, which I'll make green. This is the omega vector. We've got the location of the point P here. And uh, for sake of argument, just to kind of build our in intuition, let's say that the point P is on the body. That means that it is attached to the B-frame. If it's attached to the B-frame, then look at this equation up here. This thing, this part would be zero, because if anything is attached to the B-frame, it's not going to change with respect to the B-frame. But there still will be a contribution, oops, will be a contribution due to this other piece. The uh, the purely rotational piece. Okay, now here's what you do. You imagine you are, um, what's gonna happen if we sort of just let this, this is a frozen frame, but let it kind of play forward as a movie. You know that P is going to move around. It's gonna kind of move around in a circle as drawn by these dashed lines. So here is my terrible sketch of an eye looking down. So here's an eye looking down. So seen looking down from the axis of rotation, what will you see? This is the instantaneous axis. Um, well, the point P, which is like we said on the body, moves in a circle. of uh, radius, some radius rho. Let's call this thing, I'll call this rho, okay? So looking down from the axis, we've got the point P and it is got some instantaneous velocity. There's a velocity drawn on the, the 3D diagram. Um, and this is a circle of radius rho. Um, and 
the angle, let's just say that theta equals the angle between the omega vector, which we're using just omega, that's shorthand for omega body frame with respect to an inertial frame. Theta is the angle between omega and the R vector. And we're just writing that as R. So uh, that gives us what rho is. Rho is R sine theta because, well, what's uh, R, the scalar R is the magnitude of this vector R. Now, imagine that uh, omega is constant. So this, we got some, we have steady rotation, or it's sometimes said pure rotation. Then the magnitude of this velocity, magnitude of our velocity here, is equal to rho times omega, where omega, the scalar, is magnitude of omega, the angular velocity vector. And if we substitute in what uh, rho is in terms of the magnitude of r, the r vector, and the angle between omega and r, the two vectors that we're talking about here, we get r sine theta omega. And you can, you can write v, this velocity v, can be written as omega cross r. What you'll see is it gets both the direction correct. If you do, just do with right hand rule, omega cross r, your thumb should be pointing in a direction that's kind of tangent to the circle that's going around. It gets the right direction and it gets the right magnitude. As a property of the cross product, if you look at the magnitude of omega cross r, it's equal to the magnitude of the two vectors times sine of the angle between them. And so that's the same as this up here. So V equals omega cross R. That's the source of going back up here, this part of the, the purely rotational part of the transport equation. And so hopefully that gives you some idea. Remember, this is just for a point on the rotating body. So if that point, suppose uh, point P isn't fixed on, on the body. I don't know why I, I like to imagine this, but imagine a potato that's spinning and I've got an ant on it. If the ant is standing still, then this will be its inertial velocity. If the ant is moving, well now it has the speed with respect to the potato. And so there would be this other part up here, the speed or velocity with respect to the body itself. And so you add those two up and you get the total inertial velocity, okay? So let's ponder that. Um, what else comes up? Sometimes in, in, in the homework, we have that too. You have to deal with multiple frames that are all rotating with respect to each other. So I, I won't give you anything super complicated. How about a, like a robot arm. If I've got a, here's some kind of robot arm attachment. And I'll make it do something like that. I've got, let's say an inertial frame right here and one and two. Well, I'll just call that frame A. And then frame uh, B is attached to this first segment, B1, B2, it's the B frame. And then let's say I've got a frame attached to this 
other link. So this is just a multi-link thing, kind of like a robot arm, or just think of your elbow and your arm. I'll call this C1, C2. I think I have to go back and change these ends to A's for consistency. Yeah, it's A1 and then uh, A2. So if we have multiple frames like this, and they'll each have some angular velocity. So let's say we've got the angular velocity of, of C with respect to B, right, these two. And then we've got the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the A frame. So it'd be these two. How do we relate the angular velocity of the C frame with respect to the A frame? Well, they, they add up. There's an angular velocity addition formula. So omega, uh, the rotation of the C frame with respect to the A frame, the angular velocity, is the B frame with respect to the A frame plus the C frame with respect to the B frame. So this is called the angular velocity addition formula. And uh, I've drawn a sketch in 2D, but this, this works in 3D. So that can be handy when you've got multiple frames. And sometimes in uh, problem setups, to get the kinematics right, you do need to introduce some intermediate frames that maybe won't be part of your final answer because it helps you conceptually think about it. So whenever, the, if there's multiple rigid bodies and they're attached by joints and things, it might be good to introduce a frame attached to that body, each body, intermediate body, okay? All right. We're gonna talk now about purely translating frames. What we've done up here, basically rotating frame. This was like a purely rotating frame because we're not imagining that uh, you know, the origins is moving. But uh, suppose you've got origins that are, that are moving, fancy name for moving, it's translating. Um, so this is in section 3.6 of Kasdan and Paley. So what's the, I, I always like to have a sketch to get things started. I've got a point P. This is the thing that I'm gonna eventually wanna you know, track, get its inertial velocity and all of that. And I am viewing this from a frame. I'll use B again. So this is my B frame. And the origin of the B frame is O, I'll call that O prime. Now maybe B is attached to my car. And let's say I'm just going in a straight line. So it's just translating. There's no, I'm not turning my car. Maybe P is a bird. And I wanna track how the bird's moving compared to my car that's moving. And there's an inertial uh, origin O and inertial directions and one and two. And I'll write I as my inertial frame. Well, ultimately, I'm, I want uh, the location of P with respect to O, but I've got, um, I could also use information about how is my car moving? So the location of the origin O prime with respect to O, and then in my, what I see from my car, it's gonna be, P compared to O prime. Well, the way that I've written these, you know, three R vectors, uh, hopefully it should be clear what the addition formula is relating them. R P O equals R O prime O plus R P 
O prime. So just like there's a angular velocity addition formula, this is just position vector addition, or let's just call it vector addition. All right, so that's the setup. That's how the frames are related. Um, I guess I do need to say something like, you know, B frame is purely, maybe I'll put that in parentheses, just means there's no, it's not rotating, it's just translating. Meaning it's uh, it's got some velocity with respect to the iframe. And, and that'll just fall out of the math once we start looking at things. Okay, so to do, eventually to do Newton's laws, we're gonna need the inertial acceleration of P. Meaning the acceleration of P with respect to O, the origin of our chosen inertial frame. So the first step would be we got to get the inertial velocity. So that means inertial derivative of uh, RPO. And we'll call that a shorthand IVPO. I think that's the same shorthand we used last time. And now we'll use the, um, uh, well, we'll just use the fact that we're taking a derivative. So derivative of this first vector up here is gonna be the derivative of this one on the right-hand side plus this one on the right-hand side. So inertial derivative R O prime O plus inertial derivative of R P with respect to O prime. Okay, we will refer to this term, this is the inertial velocity of O prime with respect to, o. basically this is the instantaneous inertial speed of the B frame, okay? It's the inertial speed of my car, which does not go above 65 miles per hour, let's say. And then the second term is the inertial velocity of P with respect to O prime. So, we have this relate. Let's drop this down. Here's everything written in terms of velocities. We've got that. Um, I'll write it again, but this time the inertial velocity, well, the velocity of the point P with respect to O prime. We don't have to actually write this as with respect to the I frame. We could just write it with respect to the B frame. So it's the speed that I would see, velocity of P with respect to the B frame. And we get that using the transport equation. So this equality, this equality right here in red, this is due to the transport equation. And including that the B frame is not rotating. So let's uh, highlight that. And this is, I think, written as equation 3.55 in the book, if you're gonna be tracking with that. Uh, so we could describe each of these terms. This, is, this term on the left-hand side, this is the velocity of P with respect to the I-frame. This term is the velocity of the B frame with respect to the I frame. And usually the B frame is gonna be attached to something. Right now we just have it as abstract, but it'll be attached like my car. Um, and this, is a, this last one is the velocity of P with respect to the B frame. And I use my car because my car does not go at a steady speed. My, my car could accelerate, speed up or slow down. And so how would I relate what I observe from my car and uh, use that for Newton's second law? So we need to take another derivative so that we can get the inertial accelerations. So we take another 
Let's just write it as superscript i d by dt, inertial derivative with respect to the i frame. And we get hopefully what you would expect the inertial acceleration of p with respect to o equals the acceleration of the b frame origin o prime with respect to o plus acceleration um, with respect to the b frame of p with respect to o prime and maybe some explanation of each of these so this is the this thing on the left hand side, this is the inertial acceleration of P. That just means acceleration of P with respect to the I frame. That's the thing that's going to go into Newton's second law. F equals M A. That's the A. It's got to be that. Um, you wouldn't use this, but this is an important part of it. Um, this is the inertial acceleration. It's awful looking. Inertial acceleration of the B frame, right? Or if you want the acceleration of point O prime with respect to O. And then this is the, the acceleration. And you could also write it this way I, as with respect to the I frame. We're using the transport equation again to say, well, you could write this with respect to the B frame. Um, this is the acceleration of P with respect to O prime in the, that's in the B frame, like the B frame origin. Okay. Let's see, where were we? FP equals MP inertial acceleration. I don't like it when the computer does that. Okay, now I'll just substitute in what we have up there. Maybe this will actually make it clear for you. We're just substituting in and uh, yeah, it doesn't matter if we put the superscript B, all that matters is this is the acceleration of O prime with respect to O. Now rearrange and we get M P acceleration of P B O. Something's wrong here. What did I write wrong? Oh yeah, yeah. This is uh, P with respect to O prime. Okay. So P O prime equals the actual force minus this fictitious force. And so, like we said, that's a fictitious force. Um, due to the acceleration of the B frame with respect to the I frame. All right. So um, let's think about this. If you've ever hung something from your rear view mirror and you accelerate, I mean, if it can kind of dangle and be like a pendulum, you'll probably see see it move. Like if I'm, if I'm going this way, you'd see it whoa, going backward. And that's because uh, it's as if the pendulum is, it, is in an accelerating box that is your car. And so that fictitious force is what makes the thing move. So how would we set that up? Um, this is actually an example in the book, three point, example 3.14. It's a pendulum. Well, what is it really? It's a pendulum in an accelerating box. So how would we set this up. We're, we're in a box. Maybe we're in the box. 
we're trying to think outside the box, but we're in the box right now. Here's our pivot point for the pendulum. There's our pendulum point P and it's got a mass, you know, MP. Here's the origin, we'll call that O prime, kind of following what we've done above, and define our B frame this way, B1, B2, and we've got a vector, I'll do it in orange, the location of P with respect to O prime, okay but the box is accelerating. So there's some acceleration of this box with respect to an inertial origin. Well, let's write that inertial origin. So this is the uh, B frame. B frame is attached to the box and we've got a uh, inertial frame. There's our inertial origin. We just sort of line these up, to make life easy for us, right? They don't have to be lined up, the end frame Unit vectors don't have to line up exactly with the B frame unit. It just, if you can make that choice, make that choice. So this is the I frame. And uh, this is the location or position of O prime with respect to O. And the box is actually moving. So O prime is accelerating. I don't know if it's going to the right or the left, whatever, it's accelerating. So you can, that's sort of the setup you could look at that example more if you want to get the details of, uh, you know, if you've got constant acceleration, what will happen to the, the angle between P and the downward direction. And if you've ever tried to maintain a constant acceleration in a car, you can't really do it for long, but you'll see that something dangles back. I got to uh, test drive a Tesla that had some kind of, there was a button on it that said like ludicrous speed. They were testing this out at VTTI, the Transportation Institute. And it, it could maintain, it felt like some significant fraction of G uh, for a good like two or three seconds. It was pretty awesome. So if you have that opportunity, I say do it. All right. Um, so we've talked about rotating frames and then purely translating frames. Of course, in the real world, you're gonna have a combination. So there'd be combining, rotating, and translating frames. And that's where it's good to look at the homework because that will help you think through it, um, even though it's not graded. Just because things aren't great, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do them, right? I think that you, you probably know enough to do probably all of homework one, maybe. But at least the uh, those rotating frame questions. And then, and like I said, we'll talk about those uh, more next time. Uh, plus you could talk about it with, uh, during office hours and things. All right. Before I go on, um, cause I'm gonna talk about linear momentum and angular momentum. Uh, are there questions about this frame stuff? Going once, going twice, gone. Okay. You gotta be careful with frames. That's where people mess up some. So well, usually if you can do the kinematic, what we're talking about now is kinematics. We're not really relating forces necessarily. This has been focused on just figuring out accelerations and all that stuff. And that is called kinematics. Uh, the other part of dynamics is called, sometimes called kinetics or sometimes it's just called dynamics. But kinematics is just describing the motion of something. And it's the, what I've noticed in 15 years of teaching this stuff is that most students will get um, stuck on the, the, the kinematics part. So it is good to use um, 
careful notation. That's why we're being really careful about these subscripts and superscripts because after a while you will appreciate that. You'll even be able to drop it because it'll just be familiar to you, but it is good to keep all that for now. All right. Linear momentum and angular momentum for a single particle. That's what we'll talk about. Mechanics is very old and sometimes there isn't consistency across things that otherwise should be consistent. Like if I got to name this, I would not call it linear momentum. I'd probably call it translating momentum. And I wouldn't call it angular momentum, I'd call it rotating momentum. But we are stuck with what we have inherited language-wise. So linear momentum, uh, we'll talk about that first. Yeah, if it was up to me, I would call this translational momentum. But I don't think that's going to catch on. Maybe make it into a hashtag or something if you want. All right, so we've got our particle. Uh, and I'm not even going to label this P. I'll say it's, it's a, it has a mass M. And then I'm just doing a little cartoonish version of a inertial frame with an origin O. So that's our inertial frame. Here is the position of uh, M with respect to O. This has an inertial uh, velocity. I'll just write that way. And we define something called the linear momentum this way. Usually use the superscript I, P. It's a vector and I'll use three lines. This is, means it's a definition. This is the mass times the inertial velocity. And that is the linear momentum. Uh, so if we wanted to you know, draw it, it would be something, it's a vector that's in the same direction as the inertial velocity. It's just scaled by the mass. And what is so significant about this? Well, if you take the inertial derivative of the linear momentum, this is m times, of course, we're making the assumption this is a single particle with a mass m that does not change. M does not change, mass doesn't change. If we're talking about rockets and things, then okay, we're doing something else, but we're not doing that right now. So this, the inertial derivative, uh, the only thing that can actually change in time is the um, uh, inertial velocity here. So this ends up looking like that, right? I guess if, if you missed something there, inertial derivative of the inertial velocity, which means mass times the inertial acceleration. And whoa, what do you know? That's ma. So we know that that equals the total force on the particle. Uh, let's draw it this way. Here's the total force on the particle. And we could also write this as uh, p dot. So p with an over dot, that just means rate of change with time. So here we can sketch it out. So the rate of change of the linear momentum is equal to the force on the particle. Maybe I'll do that in green. There we go. So this is, you could view the, uh, unfortunately this doesn't have a nice like succinct name, 
but it's the it's the rate of change of linear momentum equation. And it looks nice that way. Uh, let me just put an asterisk and say that a special case is if the total force is zero, there's nothing there, then the, the linear momentum is equal to constant. It's a constant in time, which means that the linear momentum at any time t is equal to the momentum it, as it was initially. And then this gives gets names like the law of conservation of linear momentum. But really it's just a special case of the rate of change of linear momentum. All right, angular momentum. I think angular, when I think of something that's angular, I think of like right angles and I just, this doesn't quite capture it, but that's the historic name. Again, if it were up to me, I would call this rotational momentum. And if that ever trends on Twitter, I'll be amazed. So let me sketch something again. Here's the origin of our inertial frame. Uh, and now, um, because we're going to have to deal with other things, I will now refer to this particle as P. It does have a mass M. And isn't that great? Um, I'll write the inertial, I mean, the problem, I have to put like an underscore on that piece, you know, it's capital P, so you don't think of it as the same as the linear momentum P. And so the book will use linear momentum P and it'll write subscripts like P with respect to O. Yeah, that's fine. Um, total force down here on the particle P. So that's kind of our setup here. We define the angular momentum on P in a certain way. It'll, it'll be a vector. We define the angular momentum on P about the point O. So this is what's weird. When you define angular momentum, it's always with respect to some point. The linear momentum wasn't necessarily with respect to any particular point. We could have chosen any number of inertial frame origins and we'd still get the same linear momentum. Angular momentum is different. It depends on the point about which you're measuring angular momentum. So the notation of the book is to call this little h and then, you know, that's superscript i. P O, this is the angular momentum, and it is defined as the location of particle P with respect to O. So let's write that in here. Cross the linear momentum of particle P. So we would call this vector the angular momentum with respect to O. And just like we could get the time rate of change of that, uh, of the linear momentum above, now we're gonna get the time rate of change of the angular momentum and see what that comes out as. So we will take the inertial derivative of this uh, h vector. And now we've got uh, the right hand side, we've got the inertial derivative of a cross product r cross p. So we'll use the the rule for taking derivatives of cross products 
which is just looks like the product rule. We first take the, it's the inertial derivative of the first vector cross the second vector plus first vector cross inertial derivative of the second vector. Okay, um, let's see if we could recognize some things here. This is the inertial velocity of P with respect to O. This thing is in the same direction. It's the mass times the inertial velocity. So these two vectors are in the same direction. When vectors are in the same direction, their cross product equals zero. And over here, this is the inertial derivative of the linear momentum, which we showed up here is equal to F, so the total force on the particle. So that's from Newton's second law. So gathering everything together, what do we, give myself some room here. This equals R, cross F. And because we'll use this concept later, we're gonna call, uh, we're gonna give a name to this vector called R cross F. So if you look at this diagram up here, do R cross F, and then whatever direction your thumb's pointing. Um, so we'll call that M P O. And what is M P O? M P O, well, it's just this, it's R cross F. Kind of the moment arm about your chosen reference point. Here we are using O, the origin of our inertial frame is the reference point. Later we'll use something else as the reference point. So M for moment. R cross. F, okay. This is sometimes called, uh, just to be clear, it's the moment about O. It's the moment on P about the reference point O. So now we have a, if you want, we have a shorthand way to write the, this is the inertial derivative, that over dot and inertial derivative of the, angular momentum. So the time rate of change of the angular momentum equals the moment. And being careful about what point is this in reference to. The reference point is O. There would be other terms if O was not inertially fixed. So this is only the case, this is when the point O Maybe we could just clarify that this is the reference point we're using. And the reference point O is inertially fixed. Otherwise we'll have something else. Does this have a name? Well, it's the rate of change of angular momentum equation. Um, I think the book and I will probably call it the rotational dynamics equation, sometimes, so AKA, also known as the Euler equation, but you gotta be careful when you say Euler equation. If you Google Euler equation, you'll get something with like e to the i pi something, so watch out. Plus there's uh, the Euler equation for fluids. As long as you know you're talking about like particle and rigid body dynamics, then it's this rotational dynamics equation. Um, and you know, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? Well, because it'll show up later when we talk about rigid bodies, but also even for dealing with particles, maybe this will be my asterisk here. Sometimes using the rotational dynamics equation is more convenient than using Newton's laws.
more convenient. Like you get your answer faster. And what are the situations? And that might be true. When the motion is mostly rotational. So let's look at a case of that. And this will take us to chapter four of the book. We are just blasting through it. Okay, so this is example. Professor Ross, I'm a- Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the time rate of change of angular momentum, I, uh, you describe that as a moment. I, I think I've heard in the past that that's a torque. Is there a difference between a torque and a moment? I'll say no right now, but we do later talk about it. I mean, they're basically the same concept, moment, arm, cross of force. Okay. So yeah, I think Thanks. it is the same. I often think of a torque as related to control, but yeah. The book, um, the book will use the term moment and maybe later torque interchangeably. But yeah, they're, think of them as the same. So this would be like the torque due to the, uh, the total force on point P. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. So example 4.4, this is just the pendulum, which we introduced uh, last time with, remember that Cartesian coordinates and then got frustrated and gave up. Uh, but a pendulum, right? Everyone has intuition about a pendulum. It's not a very good pendulum. It has a very high rate of damping because of my finger. We're gonna, analyze the simple pendulum using the rotational equation that we just went through. So let me conjure up an image. I don't like when it says may take several minutes to prepare. That's very worrying. Um, all right. So this is the, this is a diagram from the book from the example 4.4. And it's, um, they go through these examples carefully so you get an idea of, okay, what are the, like the, the first panel here says, well, what coordinates are you going to use? And it's using basically uh, polar coordinates. And then B is like, well, what reference frame are you going to use? So it sets up this inertial frame, which is where E1 is down, E2 is to the right, so we've got this inertial frame. And there's an implied E3 coming out of the screen. And then it has a B frame, which has the same origin. So we're, it's a, a simple pendulum. The pendulum pivot isn't moving, like in my car example, it's, it's staying still. And we've got ER. E theta, and notice we do ER cross E theta with our right hand rule, we should get uh, E3. So E3 is common to both of these frames. It's just the third direction, okay. And then the panel C, this third panel is the, the free body diagram. So look at the particle, what are the forces on it? We've got a force due to um, tension in the, rod and then the force due to gravity which is m times the acceleration due to gravity g and then you've got the direction the downward direction e1 okay if we were to um let me write the location of here's p this is o so i'm writing in orange this is r p o We, we can write that as it's a, a constant L, right? That's the, that's the length, the pendulum, L, and then it's in the ER direction. So now, what is the inertial velocity? It is the 
inertial rate of change of R P O. Um, if you wanted to be careful and use the transport equation, you'd say, well, I need to look at the derivative of this vector with respect to the B frame, but the B frame is attached to the pendulum rod. It rotates with it and everything. So that's just going to be zero plus, now maybe this will give us some trouble, inertial, uh, sorry, angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the I frame cross that position vector. Okay, what is the inertial, I mean, the angular velocity? Um, over here, we've defined coordinates theta. So this would be over here, again, theta. And as theta changes, that's theta dot. So theta dot is the rate of change of that frame that's attached to the pendulum. What is the axis of rotation? Well, it's the, it's the axis coming out of the screen. It's E3. So the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the I frame is rate of change in terms of a coordinate. So theta dot and then the axis of rotation E3. So over here, we could write this as theta dot E3 cross L E R. So just substituting in what we know for omega, what we know for R. This is L theta dot E3. We pull out the scalars and then we're just left with the unit vectors E3 cross E R. And now use the right hand rule. E3 cross E R, my thumb is pointing in the E theta direction. L theta dot E theta. And what was all this? This is the inertial velocity of our particle. Great. Okay. Um, what about the linear momentum? The linear momentum is just the mass of the particle times the inertial velocity of the particle. So this is ML theta dot E theta. The goal here right, was to use the rotational equation. So we are going to, we need to write the angular momentum of the particle P or point P about O and that's Going back to the definition, it's R cross the linear momentum, which is what? This is L E R cross M L theta dot E theta. Pull out all the scalars and things. We have M L squared theta dot E R cross E theta. Now again, use the right hand rule. Uh, e R cross E theta. My thumb is pointing in the E3 direction. So this becomes E3. So the angular momentum M L squared theta dot E3. And maybe this is good at reminding us what, it, what should be the units of angular momentum. It's mass, length squared, and then what is theta dot? It's one over time. So mass, length squared over time. Uh, okay. Let's take the, we're going to need to take the inertial derivative of that. Um, notice that the, the E3 vector, it's a, it, it's fixed in the inertial frame. It's an inertial vector. So we don't have to worry anything about, you know, what's the time rate of change of E3. So that's good. And the only thing that could change is theta. The length's not changing, the mass isn't changing. So we've got ML squared derivative of theta dot E3. 
okay, this is ML squared. We'll just for shorthand write theta double dot. Okay, and this was in our shorthand, this is the H dot P O. Okay. Uh, that's one half of the rotational equation, the left-hand side. The right-hand side was the moment. So here we've got, uh, let me go to this free body diagram up here and write our point O. Remind ourselves of this vector R, P, O. So, the total force on point P is some unknown force due to the tension in the rod, which is in the ER direction, plus mass times ac uh, acceleration due to gravity, E1. Okay. M, P, O, so the moment on the point P about the point O is that moment arm, RPO, cross the total force. This is L, oops, total force of RP, L E R cross the force due to the tension plus Mg E1. Now I want you to notice something. Well, E R cross E R is gonna give us nothing. So the force due to tension in the rod does not contribute to the moment, only the gravity, only gravity does. So what we're gonna be left with is LMG ER cross E1. And we could hopefully just based on this diagram up here, especially the second one, we could figure out what is the relationship between E1 and E2 of the inertial frame and ER and E theta some kind of rotation matrix or just relationship between them. Um, like I can write from this that E1 equals cosine theta ER minus sine theta E theta. Maybe I'll leave that as an exercise for you to figure out you know, that relationship. So then this becomes well, anything with ER in it, cross ER is gonna go away. So what we're left with is minus L M G sine theta ER cross E theta, right? I chose to write E1 in terms of B frame components so that it'd be easier to do the cross product. Okay, ER cross E theta, this is, it's E3. Again, we already did that up above. So this is E3. All right, so bringing down here, what do we have? The total moment is just due to gravity. L, M, G, sine, theta, E3. You might say, well, why didn't you just look at the horizontal distance and blah, blah, blah. Well, because we're trying to figure out how to do this in 3D for complicated situations. So the sort of rules of thumb that worked in the 2D world of sophomore dynamics won't necessarily carry over to the complicated system you're gonna analyze as part of grad school. Uh, so that's why we do it this way. All right, now I want you to notice, here's this, the left-hand side of the rotational equation that shows the time rate of change of things. And then the moment side, which shows kind of the force related things. And there they are. So we're gonna set these two equal to each other over the rotational dynamics equation. Rotational dynamics. I don't know if you can hear that, but my dog is whining and at the door, my office. Um, if he came in here, he would jump on me. All right, so, Gosh, that over dot looks very severe. Shouldn't be so severe. So that's a rotational equation. We just noticed E3 is the component in both of them. So this vector equation 
the only uh, entry that's non-zero. Uh, I can't. I can't let the dog. In. I, he'll. He'll. He'll give up. Um, M L squared theta double dot equals negative L M G sine theta. All right. Now we cancel some things out. I always like to write ODEs in the form of ODEs. Like you have the derivative stuff by itself equals, and then you know everything else. So we have the derivative by itself. We're going to have to cancel the M's and move an L over. So we get negative G over L sine theta. And if you were to double check this, this is the same differential equation you would get with uh, Newton's laws. What was the advantage here? Well, we had a force due to tension, which kind of confuses us when we do Newton's laws, but it naturally falls out because it doesn't contribute to the moment about the pivot point. Oh, so that's nice. What if you were to simulate this? Okay, if you were to simulate this, this is a second order ODE in MATLAB. And it's one of the appendices to the book mentions, um, like so really brief, here's uh, you know two lines of code that can simulate things for you in, in, in MATLAB. So it's really convenient that way. And I think everyone on campus Everyone who's a student should be getting a license for MATLAB. Like you don't have to pay as far as I know, don't quote me. But what do you do here? You define, here's what we do. You could define something I'll call X1 as theta. Oops, theta. And define X2 as theta dot. Then uh, this equation of motion says that x2 dot equals negative g over l sine of x1. And then this definition itself down here gives us the other ODE, uh, x1 dot equals x2. So usually you would write this in the form derivative of the first thing, and then the derivative of the second thing. And so now you've, you've got two, instead of one first order ODE, you've got two first order ODEs. And this is in a form you could use with uh, ODE, 45, I think it's all, it's written all lowercase, like ODE 45 in MATLAB. Um, another thing you might think about is slightly more complicated situation of a, now I'll call it O prime, very suggestively. If we have a pendulum that's in a cart, So now we've got a, mid, a moving, um, we'd want to take our moments about the point O prime, but O prime is moving. So how do we get the rotational equation? Oh, I don't know. Um, that'll just have to wait till next time. Uh, I will show you a little video of a pendulum in a card. Hopefully this isn't loud or anything. Oh, it's kind of pleasant. So this is the swing up. If, you, if you've taken a control class, like this is a common system to look at. Um, even experimentally, it's like you start with the pendulum down and how do you swing and you know, do it in the least time, maybe some optimal control, um, and then you get it inverted. And then maybe somebody comes along and pushes it and you say, is it, is it robust? I don't know if somebody pushes it here. I think they do. Yeah, they kind of tap it. Uh, maybe not. Okay, maybe somebody gives it a little bit of a tap. 
Give it a little bit of a tap. Give it a bigger tap. Okay, he won't. Anyway, so that's it for today.